Hey, everybody there. Welcome to another brand new episode of the Because Cannabis podcast every single Wednesday, 420 p.m. on YouTube and every single week on Spotify with video and anywhere that you listen to audio podcasts, brand new episodes of the show debut new shows like we had last week where Dustin and I break down a lot of the headlines happening in the industry. And then shows like today where we find amazing folks working in the cannabis industry and we get to highlight them. We get to highlight their stories. We get to highlight a lot of stuff and learn a lot of stuff, Dustin. That might be. Welcome to the show, Dustin Cobb. I'm BC Wayman. That's Dustin. How are you doing today, today, man? I'm doing awesome today. Feels like I am as well. Wound up as always. Uh, that might be one of the perks. It's not the free weed. Only King Palm sent us free stuff so far, but you know, it was great. Uh, it's not the free stuff, but maybe the best perk of the job, so to speak. Is it a job if you don't get paid? I'm not sure. The best <laughs> perk of whatever this is, Dustin Kava, is the ability to learn education, yeah. right? It's a buzzword everyone always talks about in this industry. You got to be more educated. I don't think, though, Dustin, that they're always taking the time to educate themselves. But that's what this is. It's like a one-hour lesson. Every single week, whether it's current news and headlines or whether it's backstories and advice from those who have walked the walk and talked the talk in this industry, it's a really amazing experience. And ironically, Dustin, I find myself, where do you think and how have your, I guess your vibe or your mindset, has it shifted? We're coming up on what two years almost that we've been doing the show, talking to a ton of people. Uh, I have changed dramatically in my thought process and how I think about the plant. I feel like I started way more commercially naive and not caring as much about the plant and mother earth. And I'm like, I'm ready to grow in the backyard. I'm ready to just wear more tie dye. I may even grow a beard like you, Dustin. I'm not <laughs> sure what I'm going to do, but I'm feeling more in touch with the plant in the industry. Have you shifted? You always started. And that was kind of how we began. I was more of the yin to the yang. I was more business and you were more kind of focused on the patients and the people and the plant. And have you, are you still that way? Are you becoming more frustrated? What's your mindset been over the last couple of years as we've been doing this and learning and talking with so many amazing folks oh, man i think i've actually been i think i'm actually more sympathetic to the industry now than i ever was i think before i was so customer focused and their stories really moved me enough but now i think i i just as much as i have problems within the industry and the way it works and how it markets itself i am way more sympathetic to those who are taking part in it and really trying to build something under the current guidelines under anything it's it's actually pretty incredible the resilience that you you have to have in order to compete in this market it is pretty incredible that is a through line of many of our guests resilience right uh in that era i'm excited today to talk with terrence white our guest today because it's an area we haven't talked with someone from we haven't had much experience with people in the virginia uh, in the Maryland. I know we had a, um, we always have Gibby. Gibby is large. Gibby is in Virginia, but we don't talk as much policy and stuff with Gibby. We talk a lot of his great products at Lissett glass that he makes down there. Shout out to Lissett glass. Uh, one of the best producers of American glassware in the country based out of Virginia, Lissett glass, Gibby Dowdy, a uh, friend of the show. Um, but we haven't really talked DC policy as much and no. it's always an interesting experience. We get a lot of folks from out West, a lot of folks from Colorado and such. So we get to hear some of those original cities and States, but ironically enough, you know, thanks to a few folks, the D'Angelo's out there and some other folks, uh, D.C. is kind of a longer time original legal state, even or what's the technicality, legal area. I should know my geography. territory. Yeah, territory. I don't know, something like that. Our guest is down below in the weight room, just shaking his head like, what are these? <laughs> I have no idea. Well, yeah, you're correct. We don't have any idea, uh, but we kind of pretend right around the air. We have microphones. It makes us official. Uh, <laughs> overall, it just gets right there, Terrence. Uh, as I'm saying this, as I'm clearly have no idea what DC is technically called. Uh, are you embarrassed already? Like, what are these? No, guys no, guys. It's, most people don't understand. DC is a territory. Um, just like Puerto Rico and, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we've been fighting for statehood or that 51st state for, oh, man, I've been here 28 years, so um, longer than I've been here. Um, so uh, our taxes, uh, ta taxation without representation. 
So that there yeah, it taxes is. without any say, exactly. Tax exactly. without any representation. You have guys that are yep. flying in from all over the country, staying two days out of the month, and getting to dictate what and how you guys operate, which is a really hard space to be in, which none of us actually have to deal with. Except well, you know, and it used to didn't be that way. Um, so, you know, the, you know, I, I don't know if you guys recall. Um, Maybe maybe you're old enough or not, but um, DC had a mayor named Marion Barry, um, mm -hmm. and um, and Mary Barry got um, convicted for drugs. Uh, it was it wasn't even drugs. I can't remember his charge, so I don't want to be don't want to be state the wrong. But basically, what that was was Congress uh, power to snatch DC authority back from them, <laughs> and basically when dc that's when dc lost his representation because up until that time and i think that was my mind is not as good as it used to be um but that limited dc's power at that point because the city once had the the power to make all decisions without congress interfering and um that's why we're in the pickle or the jam we are right now because we basically have a rider over our recreation um adult use here in dc because andy harris um who sits um as a u.s congressman from maryland put a rider on dc so they they couldn't do adult use that's how i-71 and gifting came about in dc because we needed a loophole well fast forward today that loophole is closing and we all have to go um, to the medical side um, and we're still fighting to get our recreational or adult use rights back from, from, from the rider. Uh, it's really incredible. Just a quick fact check. Uh, Marion Barry, uh, I believe it was, I think he got busted for drugs. I think it was Coke. It wasn't like a hotel thing. It was like it was a, a hotel, hotel thing. It was like an undercover sting or something a, like yeah, that. And, 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 and I became, he became one of uh, my mentors. Um, and if he could tell the story, I, I, I don't like, you know, getting into it too deep, sure. but, um, you know, it, it, it was bigger than, it was always sought it out because he was the guy that, um, had more power in DC than the president. And mm -hmm. that was a big issue, especially among Republicans at that at that time. And you're talking the Reagan era, right? Mm -hmm. The Reagan and Bush era. And um, so politics played a big uh, piece in why that happened. So, um, you know, at that at that time, the FBI and, and um, the attorney general um, basically, you know, along with Congress, that he was hitman number one. They wanted to take that power away from DC and 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 they did. And we've never regained that power since. Uh, so um, we're at the um, mercy of the federal government in terms of, you know, budget and how things are done. If they don't want something in DC, they have the right to veto anything that our city council and mayor brings to their footstep. It's a 30 day process after a bill is passed and then it goes to um, Congress and they can even, they can veto that bill and send it back down or um, approve it. Hmm. I, at what point due to all of the setbacks and the tribulations that, that you guys have had to kind of work through in order to kind of, sell cannabis or gift cannabis what do you think sets dc apart what the the market apart what do you think that you guys have to offer to all the other markets that have not had the same situations happen to them well you know being an elusive a black market when you get the best product you know a lot of these a lot of these states you guys ohio you coming on a lot of these states are people don't know how to grow they don't know what products so they can't basically speak to the actual connoisseur. And when you're able to, you know, when I got into business, I wanted to, to take the stitch and stigma off of cannabis. I wanted to make it luxury, which we have, make it an experience. And, you, and one of the things that BC that you talked about 
was educate educating people um you know first time users or new users how to become connoisseurs what's good what's bad um just because they rap about it that doesn't mean it's good <laughs> um, you know and, and no one ever does super specific raps you i haven't heard the cannabinoid rap yet where someone's breaking down like C and CBN and the differences. Right. No one's rapping for you know flavonoids. Yeah, no, right now. everybody's everybody's throwing a name out, and that name is supposed to be whatever, right? <laughs> but, Skittles. Uh, that's all they. That's all they say. Gorilla glue. Yeah, you're right, and but you know when you start talking about strands and you start talking <laughs> about different products, whether it's edibles or vapes or actually the flower and, and, and Dustin, you talked to, you know, when, when BC was introducing you and, and you, you knowing the municipal side and the plant side, it's all about the plant. And, and a lot of times people don't have, you know, me, you know, I, I'm, I haven't smoked in 28 years, but I've still been close to the plant. Mm -hmm. So the reality of the matter is knowing the product and knowing the people, the connoisseur um, and the consumer, and we we've, we've been blessed to do so because you know if you look at Virginia they've really just screwed up their whole cannabis program right Maryland I, yeah go on sorry and Maryland has done a good job at first it was a little shaky and they're rebounding but still you know what makes Maryland super C DC is is recreational and I could tell you um, from from a business standpoint, my sales are down 10% from last year because Maryland's <laughs> recreational. Huh. Before I had that that you know that connoisseur drive in the city, that 30, 40 minute ride, find parking to come. Now he'll pass seven or eight dispensaries. Now, if he's in the city and he wants better product, of course, he's gonna stop mm -hmm. by. But if you look at it as a whole, that's what you know, that's what the issue is. And 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 if you look at product wise, DC is stronger from the illicit or the gray market side. <laughs> we start, start talking cultivation side, still got a long ways to go. That makes me think when I th when I was listening to kind of what the Virginia governor was saying about why he's vetoing the bill, why he's changing and wants to stop a lot of what was voted in or not allow certain things to go through, it, it seemed that his exact fear is he he's saying the same words as you, but you're saying the black market has been great. And he's saying we're terrified of the black market, the black market. Grows I believe he's terrified of organized crime was yes. his quote that he yeah, said. He's terrified of the mafia yeah. apparently moving in and selling. And so here's a problem, adult use, you know, Virginia turned, you know, at any corner in DC, you can go to, and you can find a adult beverage store, right? You can get you out. You can get a liquor store in every corner. Virginia has what they call the AB store, ABC stores, right? Yep. So if it was that bad, once you just make it, uh, you know, just like I, the ABC store. And stores. I thought that they originally were. I thought out of any exactly. state that was actually going to make it a state store situation, it was going to be Virginia. And I thought that's what the plan was from the beginning. But, but as the law took fold and started being, an, it, it, none of that conversation ever came up again. The, the problem with Yonkin is Yonkin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the, the he'll stand in his own way and to see his own shadow. And, <laughs> and, and that's, you know, when you are that arrogant as a, a politician to understand that you're in a state that can um, do a net sales north of 1.5 billion and what the loop, what those um, taxes would do to a state like Virginia in terms, it's not a poor state at all. It's one of the, the richest states in, in, in the union. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're commonwealth. Everything's taxed. So highways, bridges, all the things, unemployment, you, you name it. And if you take if you take Northern Virginia, which is some one of the most lucrative areas in the country, and you tell them that they got adult use there, they have no reason to come in D.C. now. <laughs> So it's 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 crazy. You're sending you you're sending tax dollars to a territory in Maryland and in the District of Columbia. Why? Yeah. How smart is that? Okay, so let's say 
let's say that Virginia actually passes an adult use. They have dispensaries they're selling. If you are no longer the place for out of state people to come through or for people to enter into the territory to buy from you guys, where does that leave your market? How do you scale that? How do you, how do you expand your reach and truly succeed? It, it's, it's, it's down. It is DC saw 22 million people last year. <laughs> 22 million. Wow. DC what was has that from just oh from just people coming into see tourism, it. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah tourism. tourism makes perfect sense. Tourism. Hmm. I, I mean, so we're never going to suffer. Yeah. When it comes to that, there's only what New York City, maybe that gets more people. I mean, that, right. not maybe that gets more people than DC. Yeah. We have all the tourism, the monuments, the you know all the things that. Chair blossom just happened. Mm-hmm. You know, we get people from around the world just to come see trees blossom. <laughs> huh. Right. It, so you, if, if you think it from, from that attitude, then that's how we survive. Um, but more than anything else, I think that, you know, and, and, and along with me being the founder of Monco, I'm also the chairman of the I-71 committee, um, which in 2022, we got a lot of these these laws um, up to date now um, that that's coming aboard as us being getting a pathway to a license. Do we still have a long ways to go? Absolutely. I won't stop until D.C. is recreational. Um, but there's a lot of different things that are happening so that we can't get recreation. Number one I spoke about was a rider. Number two is Joe Biden and his administration because they can override that rider. If they would have put DC adult use in their budget, then <laughs> yeah, we, that we could have, you know, regular schedule programming, right? Back on track to have an adult use market, which we believe that can be north of 700, 800 million dollars. If we continue to grow tourism at that way, we can have a, a seven or 800 million dollar year um, adult use business here in DC. The, the cars are on the table. We're 8.8 square mile uh, territory um, <laughs> that sees 22 million. I, I was people. just putting all that into perspective. So it just almost think mind- about that. We're 8.8 square mile city or territory that sees 20 over 22 million people a year. Wow. You you do the math. If yeah, we it's divide an it, into, it's an incredible amount of people that you right. push through. But think I think it. Though. BC, and I'm sorry to cut you off. No, you, cut them off you, all you take it, you take 22 million, we'll divide it in half. Kids and, and people who don't smoke. We're down 11 million people. I think right now 47% of Americans say they smoke once a week or once a month. That's what the last number I saw, something like that. Mm-hmm. That's 11 million times 47% of 11 million, say almost 50%. So that's over five million people in a city that are that's roughly nine hundred thousand people. Yeah. Come on, the yeah. state of Maryland is four million people, guys. How does when you're thinking about that eight mile radius or stretch, you know, of of a business? How how the heck do we issue these licenses in a fair way that? one doesn't oversaturate it and provides a, a legit opportunity to anyone involved. And then two, how do you issue, how do, how does it, it just seems like there's a lot of people who want to have a license in a very small place. So how does, how do you go about that, you know, in a fair manner in a manner that really makes a difference to what you represent? Well, think about this. We got 8.8 square miles, but you got to remember over four, four, four of those square miles is federal government parks and federal buildings. So we're down to 4.8. Wow. <laughs> it just gets smaller and smaller. Exactly. So it's a very dense, dense area. Mm-hmm. What we try to do and what we're working on, um, I've been working on with ABBA and, and which oversees the DC licenses here in DC and, and other uh, advocates. Um, we want uh, most cities want a five to one ratio 
cultivations mm-hmm. to dispensaries, right? Mm-hmm. Or dispensaries to cultivation, excuse me. You know, we're looking at probably a seven to one. After July, hopefully they're going to put a cap on the licenses. We'll probably have about 70 licensees when it's all said and done, right? Yeah. Two-year moratorium, no license. It's going to take cultivation. The problem here is industrial buildings. Everything here is indoor. It's not It's not Ohio, guys. I can't go to Maryland and buy land to ship because we don't have uh, interstate commerce. So we're dealing with a whole bunch of op- obstacles that most states or territories are not. But what we're trying to do is also, um, you know, work on these landlords who own these industrial buildings so that we can grow micro grows, things like that, manufacturing and processing mm-hmm. on a smaller on a smaller square footage basis so we can we can thrive and be a thriving market the, 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 there's he setting up the market to be uh square footage based as opposed to plant based you know no it's, it's 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 not but what they are doing is is trying to expand zoning so that we can get more um processing and, and manufacturing um and 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 cultivation is going to be cultivation the problem is, is that you only have so many industrial buildings in, in an area of, of, of this nature or size. And so, you you know, and then there's, those buildings are a premium. So as, you know, D.C. right now, price program in the country is the highest price program in the country. It will continue to be. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, any business, a business that's associated one block from the beach you know, Virginia beach or something, they're like, I, the rent is obviously three times more than the guy who's, you know, in Southern Virginia or something. So it makes perfect sense that, that the price program would be dictated by a lot of like, how, how can we even have a place, you know, about 2000 square feet, 5,000 square feet when it costs four times the, the amount of cost. That's, I, I didn't really, it's hard. Cause you know, when you are a traveler and you're outside looking say for a delivery i'm going into dc i want my delivery i want to do to see the initial price shock and not be able to connect a lot of those dots off the rep it seems like it's a it's a hard barrier to entry it's a hard pill to swallow that's like okay yes i guess i will buy my weed for 90 dollars a gram in dc if that's what it is in dc but it just seems when patients are so price conscious and convenience conscious with their purchasing it's a hard thing to initially see that price that that cost and understand it well it, it's the thing is is like there's cheap cannabis and then there's expensive cannabis right mm. but what we're seeing say in the midwest in michigan ohio especially like missouri illinois is a lot of these big MSOs are losing their shirt mm-hmm. because what they what they've done is going in and build this 130, 150 square thousand square foot building, but cannabis prices are not people can't afford to pay thirty five, four thousand dollars a unit. Yeah, right, right. In DC, people are paying thirty five hundred, four thousand dollars a unit, and it's all setting some of the other problems. Mm-hmm. It is passed down to the consumer. So the guys that were in the black market that says that they were gifting $25, $30 eights, no one can survive on that in a municipal market. Yeah, so DC is not necessarily racing to the bottom. It's it's become a little bit more sustainable with how, how, and especially by changing the culture around the purchasing at that and and accepting that off the rip that's some of the hardest thing is that messaging to your customers of you, you know we are selling this for 80 or 90 dollars but and to be able to almost start the market under that way seems a lot better than changing it well, after three years going I, I from think, 40 to 90 and, and i think that you're still going to have some 40 45 dollar you know, cannabis and out. discounts will inevitably yeah. be around oh. as they're clearing stock and resetting their shelves. Uh, and, and stuff like and that. I, I, but I also think that it all goes to the grow, the genetics. And you guys know this, the better the cannabis, I, it's like 
you know, if, if you want to buy a Toyota, it's very reliable. It's not going to break down on you. It's going to give you that. It's not going to be, it's going to give you a good ride, but it's not going to give you a luxury ride. But if you drive up at Range Rover or Mercedes somewhere like that, you know what you're getting into and you know, it's going to cost you more money. You know, if, if people pay that for cocaine, why should they pay that for cannabis? Well, it takes a, a hell of a lot of time to do it right when you actually care about what you're doing and you want to maintain your employees and and the whole manner, the gamut of stuff, it's 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 so important. It's I, I just couldn't imagine there not being a place for connoisseurs and and we and the whole industry as a, as a, a, a nationwide being racing to the bottom. I think like, you know, uh, I, I worked a lot with high end glass. We would sell pipes that were $5,000 as opposed right. to a $5 China banger that anybody could get. And there right. still was a market. And what I found were those kind of sewers were actually the ones that did the largest base of advertising for anything that I did. They talk the most, they had the most amount of people who listened to them and cared for their insight on what they were talking about. Um, and so they built a lot of that loyalty for me, just being a connoisseur, just understanding and, the nature of why this is important. And because you said right, because you branded that way. Correct. Branding is everything. <laughs> but when you have MSOs that come in and they don't care and they give you watered down products because they brand the watered down products just as good as what you were doing. And people get catch on and people in their mind. It's a psychological thing. Oh, it's thirty dollars. Oh, it's forty dollars. It's so it's good, but I, I don't I don't so now they start comparing cannabis when they go into other stores that is fifty dollars or better. Because mm -hmm. in their head, psychological is I can get a forty that forty dollars. It wasn't. Yeah. But right, you've yeah. already in your head, in your thought process, you you think that that product is better. Until somebody comes along and says, "Oh, this is garbage." <laughs> it does happen. We are talking with Terrence uh, Terrence White, founder of Monco, uh, also the committee chairman of the I seventy one committee. Uh, talking about DC, talking about legal cannabis, talking about luxury cannabis in the state of DC. You can find links uh, in the comments uh, below in the description. Let me ask you this, Terrence. Something Dustin and I have been talking about. Something that Ohio is kind of struggling with, and some other companies are struggling with is the the prevalence of legal cannabinoids, right? Everything we've been talking about, all this regulation, thanks to the 2018 Farm Bill, is all this stuff that tests. And there's a lot of legality loopholes, shout out to DC. There are a lot of legal nuances that test above that 0.3% Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. And so you're seeing the rise D8 is probably the most commonly uh, known. CBD is also up there. I'm a big advocate of just straight CBG if you get a chance to get that. But here's what's happening right now, Terrence. I don't know if this is hitting your mailbox, but I am now getting in my mailbox in by the U.S. Post Office advertisements to buy 100% legal THC from companies like Mood. We've seen the rise. This is THCA for sale in the mail that the U.S. Post Office is dropping in my mailbox just two days ago. This is where we're at right now. Not just gas stations, not just small head shops, like the rise of legal cannabinoids like THCA, which makes me think when you're talking about people who consume cannabis and say, I can, this isn't quite you, the you, same. You, you know why that is, right, BC? Well, talk to me. I'm going to talk to you, like okay. your opinion on THCA. I mean, the hemp derived, but the marketing there's, there's behind hemp derived is there's like. Something, there's something out there called rescheduling, guys. <laughs> and rescheduling cannabis from a schedule one to a schedule three. Who owns the most patents? Government. The FDA. Yeah, right. Mm. But it's it's also this ambiguity that they're providing themselves with the marketing. Just saying the words legal cannabis is not saying hemp derived THCA. It says it's it somewhere saying, on there. Like it, it gets it, down it, to in the fine print. The, 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 the bottom line, guys, is, is that now people are taking the, those chances that they wouldn't because yes, there yes. are no reschedulings on the horizon. On and, the horizon and, is different than it happening when we Yeah, but in, think about how many chances guys were taking like me when I got in this market. That's put true. Eight point eight million dollars in a store. Exactly. That's because I took the chance, basically saying that it was going to happen. 
And why take that chance, Terrence? I mean, you're successful in a whole manner of other businesses besides cannabis. Why decide not only do I want to take the high risk with this investment, and yes, it could pay off, but what is the drive for everybody to want to touch plant matter in this industry? Why do we all go for it and dream of the dispensary aspect? or the You had a whole successful aspect? thing in real well, estate, right? With, yeah. it, it, with me, I also, you know, I'm, I'm one of the few that's vertical integrated in the city. I'm, I also are the founder of Pleasant Hill Wellness, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be vertical from day one. Can Everybody has different, different aspirations. No, that makes perfect sense. That Everybody. it just makes business sense and efficiency sense to be vertically integrated, to right. have more control when you don't really know what the market is necessarily going to be, to have all these other revenue streams and tiers that you can actually work within and make a living or sustain yourself. That makes perfect sense. We don't really see that across the board on a lot of the people that we do talk to on here. A lot of them are just a dispensary owner or just a processor or just a cold. Well, the, the thing is, is that a lot of people are, 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 are they, they look at this through a, a micro lens versus a, a macro lens. Right. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, when you're a businessman, you have to understand how to control costs and how to grow a business and how to grow efficient. And and with everything that you do, you have to make decisions based on the reality of how can I get to the next level? And it's OK, but think about it. I'm a dispensary. I got to buy at wholesale above wholesale if I didn't become a cultivator mm -hmm. or manufacturer. So now I'm, I'm eating into my profit margins. We got 280E double in here. We got right. 280 federal and we got 280E local. Oh my gosh. It's, it, it, the math ain't math. Right. <laughs> no, it's not. The math you, is not math and math. you knew that when you took the $8 million risk. So what? is it that you took the risk because you knew you were going to be loud and fight the system to invoke change after you've already got in it? Or well, I took it before you even got you into want. it. I said, if I didn't get a seat at the table, to make change and to actually be able to to fight for people of color, because you know that's my biggest thing: flower to the people. Mm -hmm. um, as as a person that is an advocacy for returned citizens like myself, and as a person who fights for people of color in a basically in a deprived community, no one has suffered more on the war on drugs than, than people who look like me. Absolutely. Okay. And we can so chop it up all you want. Continuing to, to fucking every, seven times every, the, the every drug law, with the exception of methamphetamines and fentanyl, has been because and even those is because of people who look like me. So let's not get this. We right. we got to keep it real. I mean, I noticed even in Columbus, two hours south, the the arrest rates. Are, you, are black and brown are seven seven times more likelihood to be arrested. And that's and, just and, last and, year's statistics. And, and, that's and the reason true. being is what we're talking about, cannabis. That's yeah. the first reason for exactly. them stopping it, a joint. Yep. That's that's where it starts at, started, and most, especially most rural America. Yep. When, so, when, when, when Deputy Fife ain't got nothing else to do, he's going he's gonna to profile a black or brown person and a kid for smoking a joint. That's yeah. something in 1984, our Supreme Court deemed as being good medical, but we said we keep turning our back. And every drug bill that we had since 1936, 37, first it was because they feel like black, white women were gonna sleep with black men. That That's all they needed. That That's it. <laughs> and like then, back in yeah, this is, this is when, the only thing that 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 the Confederate war had in common, they both wore him clothing. Hmm. <laughs> then you fast forward, you go to night the sixties. What happened in the sixties? Martin Luther King, the riots, the Drug Act the Bill of nineteen seventy did what? Made cannabis a Schedule One drug because they said African Americans burned cities down. We pushed for Rodney King, crack cocaine. What we blame most guys in that's in prison 
in your state, which is a swing state, most black guys my age, 47 to 50, they're not going to vote for Joe Biden. 100 to 1. Really? You would think they would. No. I would I'm shocked by that. Hold on a second. I am. For their time in prison. If they got locked up. Yeah. That 100 to 1 law. Yeah. That Obama t- overturned. They, that's who they blame for it. And it wasn't necessarily his fault and his fault alone. But that's what happened. So if you look at the history of America, and if you look at the politics of, Mer- of America, you understand why we are where we are today. Right. It's always an event that leads to something that hurts one community. So we, you know, and I, I know you guys, systematic racism. It's true. <laughs> So what do we? This is modern day Jim Crow, guys. Yeah, right. So, uh, what the? It's 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 modern day Jim Crow with an echo chamber that is so huge and so easy to figure it out. Why is it that so many people are still able to turn a blind eye to it? I mean, it's so easy and rampant to see that. I, I it, it just almost boggles my mind baffling that it still exists i'm like how do we change it it seems so it's we talk about it we have folks that talk about it we appreciate you talk about it how do we we fix it it makes it seem like it should be through the political system but now i'm learning that you know more people may not vote for someone who i feel would be more on their side but i see your point it becomes very complicated if you feel you can't vote for either party then right like then you you just get to a point where where if you look in those states and you you think about it now and I'll, i'll give you some some just background yeah, we got a brother who's sixty-two years old. He, out of sixty-two being sixty, he spent almost thirty-seven years in prison. Out of sixty-two years here in this earth, and if we take him, and if you ask him about Joe Biden today, he's gonna tell you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> he's in New Jersey. Joe Biden will be in New Jersey, but if we get into Pennsylvania, and you think about. Joe Biden losing 20 to 25 percent of an age range and that they they're they're Latino right. and they're African Americans. It ain't just because they're influent people who have money. No, these are guys who now can vote. Mm-hmm. And they sit in jail for 20, 25 years on a law that if you so if I got a gram of cocaine. If, if it's a gram of crack, it's a hundred times. Right. No, them guys ain't forgot that. Right. You huh. can't, you, 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 and you can't even ask them to forget it. No, and exactly. You cannot ask them to forget that. How could you? So as so many things that the, this administration has done, infrastructure, uh, prescription, things of that nature. Hey, I'm all in favor of it. But let's just call it what it is. The president has the right to say, I want to reschedule or decriminalize cannabis. Do you know how many votes, if he said today, how many votes he would get for just rescheduling? Because then you got a safer bank. People like me can go to a bank. If I got the safer bank at classes, I'm I'm in the black. I can go get a loan. Yep. It is weird to me that it hasn't happened. I honestly thought near the end of the Trump administration, so before the Biden Trump, I thought that that would be, I think we talked about it somewhere, that would be a card that he would pull out at the end, right, to kind of get these last minute votes, because it would seem that it would make someone very popular. We have another election coming up. Biden has that potential. It seems unlikely. Why do you, being in the heart of DC, being in the heart of a lot of that, like, why has it not happened yet? I know it's a complicated question, but it sometimes Whoa. boggles my mind. Like, what is the holdup? You know, I thought once the Health and Human Service um, uh, case study came out, I think there was over 260 case studies about how cannabis medically has helped people um, and and with different uh, facets facets of illnesses, right? Cancer, um, MS, uh, leukemia, uh, you know, just to, you know, just to state a few, right? Um. I honestly don't know. And, you know, I don't know because of this older politic generation, they have to actually die off. For yeah. I mean, the fact that we keep reelecting them to keep right. going to DC yeah. is like yeah. mind boggling to me. I am right. 
Right. But we're politicians we're, scared we're, that's that's mm-hmm. one one like we need new progressive uh yeah. people in to give us um now I was told that and I'm pretty sure you guys been that the DEA makes this decision themselves. Mm-hmm. And and that but we, we know nothing only comes but from the president, right? Mm-hmm. Um I was told that this was going to happen after Super Tuesday. He spoke about it on the state of his the union about cannabis. He touched on it. Well, here we are in an election that's tight. And if he can help one community, it's the African-American or, or, or community of color by saying, I'm going to reschedule cannabis. That's the first step. But I've asked uh, my lobbyists and some people, let's have a conversation with, with some of these people because, you know, our community needs healing. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're more rampant of, of number one, uh, single parenting, uh, domestic violence, violence in the household, um, you know, uh, major crimes and also, uh, homicides, right. To go mm-hmm. on. Let's have a conversation. And, and 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 that conversation needs to be had. Number one, from healing, because we can't just bring, and I'm just not blaming Joe Biden. No, but I will blame the last forty years of fifty years of people systematically working to destroy families and build highways in the middle of 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 you know burgeoning neighborhoods and to you know, one by one target in such a way that I, I don't like looking at the problem and saying, these are the rates of, of abuse. These are the rates as they are today without saying we systematically as a country did that. We purposely whittled away every single one of these things in order to facilitate that and facilitate the numbers that they are today. Ooh, How do we not... Question. It comes down to this. Number one, the United States has more private jails than any other country in the world. It is a big business, though. One of the largest businesses. So we, yeah, continue right. feel, we continue to fill jails with people of color, right? Yeah. We talk about the the war, the immig- the war at the border, but we don't also talk about most of these people that come in. Um, they're not criminals. They're, they're just trying to escape from the same thing that the our, our our forefathers try to do escape from poverty right now we have the highest level of poverty in this country that we ever had <laughs> there's all types of things that are happening that we do not understand but these lawmakers they got loopholes they come to washington with little money or middle class and they leave multi-millionaires yeah, that is my issue. Exactly. Exactly. And not only that, they stay here 20, right. 30 for every no no terms, no, you know, and, and so you're talking about a system that is broken overall. Now, and, and look at this. So integration started in the 60s. When 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 blacks and whites were segregated, a lot of Older folks feel like we got the best educations, whatever, you know what I'm saying? A lot of different things happened that were better for communities, right? Mm-hmm. Well, we immigrated, integrated into one system, one school, one whatever. The most segregated place I ever been was prison. <laughs> but if you look at what Congress is to, today, is that not segregation? Exactly. Exactly. Is that not segregation at its best? We've been talking about integration all our lives, about how Martin Luther King said he didn't, he just wanted us as a country, our kids and our kids' kids to get along without looking at color. But though we send people to Washington every day, and that's all they see is color. Yep. And the fact that we can having this conversation in 2024 where we're the richest country in the world right with the highest crime rate in the world and we're still in dc regulated we're a liberal city that's 
regulated has become very conservative when it in terms of business and operations. And when you look at these things, you stretch your head because you can't understand. I live on Capitol Hill. I can actually look out my window and see the Capitol right now. <laughs> wow. When the riots happened, when, when January 6th happened, you would have thought it was a movie. So I can tell you this as a longtime Washingtonian, uh, a native, uh, I'm not a native of Washington. I've been here 28 years on and off. I've seen more. I've, I've been through the real estate gentrification. I understand. I've over, overcome so many things and seen the city overcome to it's a triple A bonded. And I remember D.C. was in the red. Couldn't even pay taxes. That's why gentrification was pushed. <laughs> and 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 I, I can tell you what crack and what drugs did to a territory. This city, it tore it up. It, sent, it separated so many kids and their fathers yes and 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 this goes back to why i fight every day so that we can have a recreational market because this city is old some type of justice appropriations yeah. reciprocity however you want to name it if it's not one city in america it's dc yeah, it's pretty incredible to hear. And the passion just, I mean, it exudes from you, Terrence. We're talking with Terrence White, founder of Monco, also committee chairman of the I-71 committee, talking about legal cannabis in D.C., uh, some of the amazing work that you've done with Monco and your dispensary. I want to give a quick shout out before we let you go. I know you just hosted uh, recently and celebrated some um, women in cannabis as well. We have another uh, kind of class of folks who are typically uh, not given their due in the industry. So I appreciate you putting that message out. Yeah. Uh, talked about it on your blog. You can find information on the social media sites and the links below uh, about that, right? So celebrating. What was the impetus to do that as well, to just have this kind of women of cannabis in the area uh, celebration? It's all part, part of flower to the people, man. And, and that's my advocacy. That's working with women. I promised my mother when I got into this business that I would, I would, if I could do anything, I would highlight women, allow them to shine in a space that they're so underrated and, and haven't, uh, under, uh, valued. <laughs> um, and, and what I wanted to do is my second annual women in cannabis. Um, and shout out to Linda Green, who was my first Trailblazer of the Year award. She was the first woman in D.C., and not only woman, but woman of color, to get a, a legal um, medical license here in the district. She's done phenomenal work, um, not only in the canvas. She's, she's a mentor to many, including myself. Um, but, you know, her and I started this thing, and what we wanted to do was continue uh, to highlight women and um, put them on their own platform yep. and take that whole, that glass ceiling um, over their head and let them know that not only their value, but they're appreciated. So um, that was that for me. My late mother was a trailblazer herself. She taught for 34 years um, education. She fought for uh, blacks to vote, um, get out the vote drives, um, any way she could serve a community. She did. And um, so I had a, the example or in, in front of me every day yeah. to, to actually showcase this. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm praying and hoping that this event only gets bigger each year. Um, and I appreciate you asking me about it. What, Terrence, every day you're waking up in the face of, of, these, of this fight. What, what? brings the passion to you what what excites you about cannabis coming up in the next three four years what excites you about about manco about you know like what truly is driving because it's not just the fight and the need to make change there's got to be something else that's bringing you so much joy that really helps when you are in the thick of it, when you are truly in the trenches, in the fight that you can remind yourself of what, what is, yeah, what is that? Well, what? I mean, I think it's the determination and passion is just to, to, once I start something, I got to finish it. Guys. Yeah, I know that one. And, and I think that the, the, what, you know, the, the challenges here are, are outnumber most, you know, we're, we're in on territory waters. 
um, we're in in a unterritory industry um, that's uh, been pretty much, you know, it's new. You put in the foundations, the roads, the sidewalks, everything, right? Um, when I was in real estate, that industry has matured. Cannabis, although it's been around 2,000 years that we can bring it back to, right. it's still un, unmature here in, in the United States. And it's undervalued. And, and the plant means so much to so many people. But I think the bigger all is, is that I, I, I have my own dreams and aspirations and cannabis is is become those dreams and aspirations, and not only to help me, but to help people like me. I think that you know, for once, you know, um, you know, my grandfather's and great grandfather was bootleggers, right? Um, the government took those aspirations and dreams, how they built the house that we still own um, in our family um, with with selling moonshine. They took those things away from them. You know, why not be part of something new, something innovative, something exciting, but most of all, something that helps people day in and day out. Right. Alcohol kills people day in and day out. Cannabis don't kill people day in and day out. Now, are there other issues? Absolutely. But with anything in moderation, it's good for the boat. So it's it's THC and, and CBD is inside your body. We have cabinetite systems. And that's that's what we're made of. Our skin, our, our hair follicles, all those type things, right? That that mm -hmm. CBD and TAC has a part of. So, you know, this fight is a fight that I've deemed as mine. Is it it's bigger than me, though, guys? I need help. Mm -hmm. I need political help. I need you know, the congressmen and senators from Ohio that listen to your show or their kids or grandkids listen to your show. Hey, get involved. Let's yes. get this overturned. Let's make we always talk about free will and 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 trade free trade in other states and countries. Why can't cannabis be here in DC? No, well, it clearly should be. I will say we had a whole episode where we trashed a lot of the governorship of Ohio, so I don't think they're going to listen to us anymore. Uh, <laughs> what happens? Governor Youngkin's not listening to us anymore either after we called him a bum on the show, too. That's what happens, right? You make right. friends. You make well, great I mean, friends sometimes you got to call it like it is, guys. And I mean, and, and, it and happens. It happens, right. Uh, We've been talking with Terrence White, founder of Monco, a committee chairman of the I-71 committee. Uh, Terrence, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for awesome bringing, bringing the passion, sharing your story in a way that uh, I don't know if everyone talks about so openly and so honestly. And I think that is what made today a really enjoyable. You know how I know it's a great show? I barely talked. Dustin talked all the time, so he's all passionate. I don't <laughs> get to make my still. I still want to talk about uh if it's good for cocaine, it's good for cannabis is the best cannabis marketing tagline I've ever heard. I think you should run with that. If it works in cocaine, why not weed? I love it. Uh, Terrence White, founder of Monco, committee chairman. You're I see amazing, you guys, you were awesome today, Terrence. Thank you for joining us on the show. Yeah, we really it. appreciate back. that. I'd love to come back. And oh, you're you definitely coming here. back. You're yeah. absolutely coming. We just got the backstory today. We got to we gotta talk more fun stuff going forward. Thank you, yeah. Terrence, uh, for joining yeah. us. We really appreciate it. Thank uh, you, guys. All right, Dustin Kava, man, love it, right? Another man, I didn't even awesome realize episode. it was time yet. I was like, I was, I we could have gone another hour. I really, I was just finding really... my moment to talk, and it's just <laughs> you and interview, and that's how I know it's good though. When you get into it so much that you let you take over, and I don't get to barely talk the whole episode. That's how we know it's a good one. That's how you know today was a good episode. Hopefully, you hit subscribe uh, on that button. You hit follow if you're listening on Spotify so you can get the brand new episodes every single Wednesday, 4.20 p.m. on YouTube or Thursdays on Spotify with video and anywhere that you listen to audio podcasts. Follow us socially at MeetWM. You'll find all of the links for Terrence in the description below his social media, uh, Monco Dispensary, the I-71 committee. Give him a follow. Give him a shout if you're in that area. We got some listeners in there. We've had a few guests from Maryland area. Uh, give him some props. We want to continue to fight this fight as much as we can. Uh, we will keep doing that here on this podcast as long as we can get access to great folks uh, like Terrence. Shout out to Zoe Wilder as well for hooking us up. Uh, Dustin, Another great episode. Uh, great more great point. interviews coming up in the future. Got a lot of great guests lined up. Looking forward to talking with you with them. We'll see you next week, Dustin. Thank you, everyone.